Hello, welcome to Monday Night Ignite, everyone. It's an exciting night with a special guest. Brett Packer, the executive director of our Young Living Farms, is joining us. He's coming in from Canada tonight at his in-laws house as he just visited Fort Nelson, one of the farms that I personally have not been to yet and look forward to the day of being there. But Brett, I'm going to tell a little bit about what I know about Brett and what I know about Brett is he was given the big job in our Idaho farms, our St. Mary's farm and our Idaho, um, our uh, Highland Flats Farms, and he turned Highland Flats into what it is today. And I think that is a beautiful thing because I don't know about you, Danette and and Stacy, but when I take people to the Highland Flats Farm, they're like, "This is my favorite farm I've been to," and I attribute that to you, Brett Packer, and to Michael, who is the farm manager there. And I think that has been just a beautiful experience that you've given us there as well as now Brett has moved to the Utah world and he will be overseeing more of what's going on in the Mona farm for right now and of course he manages all the farm managers so I think that that's they have a beautiful team and we love our farmers and I'll let you say whatever else you want to say Brett but I I just have loved through the years how you've included us, how you've learned side by side, Gary Young. Um, you are, your mom is Gary's cousin, so you are part of the family. And I love that you came into our company and have turned the, the intelligence into farming on. And I really mean that, that Gary was so intelligent in his farming and he taught you and you and your brother and the rest of the farm managers have really taken it upon yourselves to take us further and further into our environmentalism and our knowledge in farming and how we can change the world and help humanity. So hats off to you, Brett, and all the people that you manage. And we look forward to hearing from you tonight. So the stage is yours. Hey, well, thank you so much, Pam, for setting this up and welcome everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, it's um, it's hard to know where to start, right? When you talk about the history. Um, one of the most important parts is I, I actually started 15 years ago with Gary when he was developing the Finca in Ecuador. Yep. I remember doing the first farm event with him ever. And I mean, it was such a challenge. The road kept on washing out and I, it was all new to me. I mean, I actually grew up with Young Living Products. And so that was very normal to me, but to actually, you know, experience the farms and how much having, you know, our people on the farms meant to Gary, I saw the effort he put into it. And it was, I mean, through a, a, a miracle, <laughs> through a constant around the clock work. And I mean, even, you know, prayer. I remember talking to Gary about that that we got every, the buses even up to the farm and we were able to show everyone the distillery. And so I came in, you know, I guess in a way, just seeing eyes wide open, how much, how important this was to Gary and to Mary to have people directly on the farm and to have that personal experience and that connection with these really special locations and, you know, that the gifts provided from them and from these, um, the, really the generosity of nature, right? Um, so, you know, that, when you have an experience like that, you don't forget it. And so when I um, transitioned into working in Idaho, Gary asked me if I'd help him with the winter harvest. And I actually didn't even know what that meant. And so I remember, you know, flying into Spokane, Washington, getting picked up by um, one of the uh, office managers, Marcy King, and get driving up to the farm I'd never been in St. Mary's. And Gary gave me a great big hug. And said, thanks, Brett, for making it. And then handed me a pitchfork and said, go ahead and jump in the tra trailer and start unloading the, the Grand Fur wood chips, you know. And so from there, you know, the winter harvests are a week-long experience. But to me and all of Young Living are one of the most powerful, informative experiences you can have. And to me, you know, I call it Gary's magic, magic formula he built. You know, who else would put together trucking, draft horses, logging, boilers, massage tables, lab analytics, you know what I mean? 
And so, and uh, you know, the connection, I mean, the connections I've made my life through these winter harvest, these events are the, the most meaningful connections I've ever made. In fact, it's even how I, I met my wife from Alberta, she joined a winter harvest. And so, you know, when you experience that firsthand, you just don't forget it. And you, I mean, the level of investment and devotion you feel because you know how powerful it is. And like I say, a four letter, letter word that I think means something different to everyone, but almost the same thing is it, it's fate. I always just felt like the fingers of fate pushing me, you know? And so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's incredible. And now here we are. And like Pamela said, we have an amazing farm team and, um, you know, they have the, uh, they have the same, but different story than I do. If you look at Nicholas Landell in France and his work with his father and Gary and Corey Howden in Canada, my brother, Chris, that oversees the labs and the Finca in Ecuador, and then all our farm managers. And it's, um, it's been a really, um, quite the test to take what Gary taught all of us and to inspire new managers. And, you know, the ones that have worked have been the ones that truly see the value in it, like Michael Carter, right? I mean, people that get the vision and live it with us. So it's, um, we, yeah, we love Michael Carter, no doubt. And so, you know, and now, we're identifying at Maxence in France. I mean, just brilliant. And he's taking over a lot of what Nicholas used to do in the operations there. We have Dan Olson in Mona, Utah. We have a new farm in Japan with Dr. Wu that's um, really, I mean, if he gets it, even though he's the newest member of the team, I mean, he just knows what this, this provides, this seed to sill model. I mean, these oils, I mean, so it's, um, it's just a it's a really exciting time for these farms and i mean and i know it, it this transition at times was rough but i think we've really shown what's on the other side it for all of us having gary exit the equation was really difficult so but is that enough i i um i can i can keep going on uh my well, background I, or the i love the background i think people realize like we have to realize a world new to us without Gary. And I just look at the stewardship of who he, who he placed in certain areas that are just so important. And you're one of those stewards. And it's very important that um, we just keep the stewardship going so that the whole company just still feels all of that connection that you talked about Gary creating. So thank you for helping us keep this connected. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, I mean, it, like I tell Mary, it means the world to me. And I know it means the world to the rest of the team. Um, it's just something so unique, right? And again, just feels so faithful. To, I know to all of us. Um, but I, you know, just a little bit more context on my, my background experience with Gary. I mean, I, I grew up in the same region as Gary on an organic farm with a lot of the same values. But I mean, you know, working with him in Ecuador is my first time to be around distillation. And to me, that's just something that, I mean, is the real magic moment. It's the alchemy, the transformation, how a 30 year old tree or a, a, a um, crop we've been working on for 10 years turns into the, the liquid gold, right? And so I, I spent a lot of my time distilling and that's when I used to distill in St. Mary's, I used to wear running shoes and run and check i mean there's all these micro adjustments that have to constantly be made because i mean if if all the pressures and the inputs aren't constant then what you get in the output the the compounds the constituents are going to be different every time and so it was you know i really learned how to distill in saint mary's with gary under under gary teaching me you know but um then i went to highland flats and was involved in the construction of that distillery that was really Gary's masterpiece. He'd seen so many things over the years and you know, what works, what doesn't. And he was constantly, you know, constantly improving things. And so when he built the Highland Flats distillery, he had all these improvements he's all, always a dreamt of. He put the digital process control system in. For those of you who have been there, you see how that every temperature, every pressure is just dialed the entire distillation. And we have, um, reports that we can look at graphs and see it's and so anyhow I went from there to Fort Nelson and helped with the construction and more the training there than the construction 
and then to Croatia. And I spent a whole summer in Croatia distilling helichrysum. And that, that was a different one because our partners there that got absorbed by Young Living, they had really old distilleries. And even the boiler was a wood-fired boiler. And so they knew distillation, but they didn't know Gary Young distillation. So that was a, a challenge in and of itself to, um, you know, train people that had a background in distillation and say, no, well, we're going to do it Gary Young style, seed to seal style. So anyhow, so I've had this opportunity to work with these, these teams around the world, be part of their training because, you know, Gary was so busy is he would have to go to the next thing. He could leave me in place and I was willing to stay there for a couple months or, you know, and so, it, but it, what has built is lasting relationships. Even when I was in Croatia this summer, I mean, there's people that I know there since 2015. The crew up here in Fort Nelson, I was just visiting. I mean, I, I hired most of them. Gary actually had me do the hiring. And so it's been these lasting relationships. And, you know, Gary was a master at providing opportunity for people, but he, it was up to you what you did with it. I mean, he would foster your growth and give you the opportunity. And that's, something I learned from him. You give people opportunities and you put them in the position for success and you, you build around them for the success, but ultimately they'll, they'll decide what they do with it. And so that's, a, it's a real honor to keep that, keep that going, you know, as we've promoted new managers at St. Mary's now at Mona. And um, it's a, it's a real lesson learned though. And it's something I really took away from Gary. He, and he actually took true joy in providing that for people. I love that you just said that, Brad, if I can add to that, because he did the same thing with product education for us. I think some of the newer people think that he told us exactly what to do, and that isn't how he functioned. He educated us and gave us the products and told us what to, you know, what they do and told us about health and wellness. And then it's up to us to figure out what we do with that. You know, and the same thing with our oils. Like Young Living provides us the oils. You all distill them. Make sure that we have them with the seed to seal quality. And it's up to us to do something with them, to share them to the world, to be the messengers, all those things. And I just want to say that you also acquired from Gary, from my observations, his patience. So you're a strong businessman, and he was that strong personality when he needed to, but really a gentle giant also, and I see that in you as well, that you have such patience with us and look so forward to educating us. So I just, if no one's told you that, I want you to hear that very strongly, that you are this gentle giant like he was, and in, in that really rubbed off. And Danette knows what I'm talking about. We'd be running the machines because he'd show us how. And if somebody messed up, it was like he never got upset. He was like, oh, it's okay. We got this. And, you know, you and your brother and um, Corey Howden and, and Nicholas, they're, you are all acquired that. And I think that he was a brilliant teacher in that way. So I hope everybody understands that he lives on through you all as well as all of us as the messengers well yeah I, I started working with gary when i was 26 and i remember looking back on it now how patient he was with me a couple times because i mean i probably shouldn't disclose this but there's a couple times i think we dang near got in fist fights you know and i mean and you know but he um he gave me grace and he, he knew I was a young man on the, on the road to development. And I mean, the amount of patience that must've taken at times. <laughs> so, you know, when you're treated that way and given that opportunity, you all, you always want to play it forward. Right. And it's, it's, it's a real honor to do it. And even at this last um, glamping event we had at Highland Flats just the, earlier this month, you know, it's like, it's a, it's a real, as a stewardship we have to, to, hold the setting that Gary built and, and I just remember all the opportunity all the relationships all the connections I was made you know in these settings these scenarios and so it's it's a real honor to keep that going I mean it, it really is special to all of us so I I, I do have a, a presentation too and we we can get to that whenever we're ready um 
hopefully we're ready to start sharing slides because I'm just working off my phone so I actually can't share the slides. So yeah, just bear with us a little bit and we'll figure this out better. You guys see all that white? I see white, yep. Perfect. There we go. So we've discussed uh, this Brett Packer. There's just a bio. If you, um, I guess this is being recorded. So if you're welcome, any of these slides, are, I mean, they're, they're for you. I mean, we build these so you can share and hopefully, you know, give us feedback too, because we're always, we're always saying, how do we get this in a format that's best for you in the field and when you need to share this information. So again, please at the end or anytime, just let us know. Um, so, you know, you hear about seed to sill all the time and I, I've been trying to articulate some key points in it. You know, things that Gary always, always so valued and were part of our practices. And there, there's kind of new terminology for it now. And so I, I look at some of the core values in our agriculture and then it's regenerative agriculture, right? So we'll jump into that more. And another key thing is reforestation. I mean, we have reforestation projects happening all over the world and then conservation. Um, and then, you know, in our distilleries and in just our oper operations, I mean, you'll, you'll see is like some subunits, utilization, repurposing and efficiency. And so, I mean, that's with, when I worked with Gary, I've never saw him say a single job was ever completed, right? I mean, it could always be improved on. It was always going to be, it was always going to be updated. And it was, it was, there was no such thing as a finished product project with them because it's an a, approach of just continual improvement. And you know, and that's something he internalized too, that you do for yourself as a person, but next slide, please. Uh oh, got a dog barking. Yeah. So again in the slide, hopefully, yeah, sorry, we got a we got an upset dog. <laughs> so um you know, when I worked with Gary in St. Mary's, and even this is a photo out of um, Mary's book, but what Gary's actually doing there is he's, he's inoculating the soils with microbes. He, he was um, always treated the soil as a living system. And so he was always trying to put more life into our soils. And he would actually breed microbes. Again, people weren't really using these words back when Gary was doing all this, but just intuitively in the way he approached everything, I mean, this is, he honored life, you know, he, he regarded the farms as a living system and especially in the soils. And so this photo, I, I just love that you can, I mean, how old does this photo look? It's probably the early nineties. And I mean, he's, he drove the whole entire farm and injected the entire farm with, with a microbiome, with funguses, with bacteria, with protozoa. And it was one of his major focuses. Um, next slide, please. Okay, well, this wasn't quite the slide I was expecting, but this is, we'll go to Highland Flats now. So I used to live in St. Mary's on the farm for two years and Gary would come and he would stay and we'd stay up at night and have dinner and talk. And we look and all, for those of you that have been around St. Mary's, it's, it's circled in a bowl of mountains. It's not quite like a, a V but, um, valley. It's like you're in this big bowl of like these mountains all around you. And in the fall, when the loggers would be done with their slash piles, you could just see a ring of fire all around us. And Gary would say, Brett, someday we're going to, we're going to distill that. We're not going to let that, that material be wasted and just burnt and go up in smoke. And so Something we've done at Highland Flats, now we're doing in St. Mary's and at Fort Nelson is we, we make contracts in wild forest lands to actually pick up these slash piles and save them from being burnt. And so one of the major things that goes into is the evergreen essence. So the last two years, this year, even especially, uh, you know, 
three farms, St. Mary's Highland Flats and Northern Lights all contributed conifers to this blend, but also slash piles. Repurpose, there you go. It's so, yeah, here's, here's the evergreen essence. Um, and this year, when you see it come out, we even put additional pine species in it. We added a, a bristlecoal pine, a, a scotch pine. And so, yeah, it's, it's amazing. And so, and this was the first year that, you know, St. Mary's used to distill all the blue spruce, all the grand fir, what was called Idaho balsam fir, then it transferred to Highland Flats. But this year was the first year that we brought conifer distillation back to the St. Mary's farm. And so when we blended all the oils from Northern Lights, Highland Flats and St. Mary's, we have all three farms will be in the Evergreen Essence this year. Yeah, I think Evergreen Essence might be, if it's not my favorite, it's tied for favorite. So reforestation, this is one of the main values you'll see in Young Living Farms. So we, um, if who, um, if you visited the Kona Sandalwood operation, it's actually was first a reforestation project. And Gary heard about the owner and operator, Wayne Lee, and was able to meet with him and actually design and build a distillery. Is that the on the big island, this this farm was on what was cattle land that was all clear cut. And so they had to rebuild these forests. And as they rebuilt it, they had to remove the dead sandalwood. And so they, they actually, there's higher levels of, of oil in this sandalwood that's um, dead. So what's amazing though, is it's actually a cloud forest and the, the cola trees there have leaves that point downward. And there's, there's really amazing before and after pictures that this was really arid and dried up and now that they've reforested it has brought the rain back and the mist that these trees collect so if you ever get the chance I mean this is one of our, it's a it's a partner farm but we consider it in the young living farm family um, Gary's invested a tremendous amount in this farm we continue to invest in this farm we were there for the diamond retreat in April and we actually donated a, a gas chromatographer to their distillery and so they're they're linked up with our team that continually does analysis day to day on the distillation, tracks all the compounds. And so it's really strong team. They joined us at the, um, the convention in Salt Lake. And I mean, they are definitely part of the Young Living family and they're always open to tours. If you get on the tour booking site, you can book a tour almost any time of year. And we want to start doing more and more events at the Kona Sandalwood Farm. And there you actually get the experience to replant, reforest and be part of this, uh, this operation. So here's another example of the reforestation efforts, the Palo Santo in Ecuador. One of my favorite oils, it's just nothing like it to me, is actually a giant reforestation project my brother Chris set up. Parts of it happen on the finca, but a large part of it actually happens in the Southern region of Ecuador. And so again, um, you know, there's a concept in regenerative agriculture and I, it's just built into the laws of nature, the universe, that you can always give back more than you take. And so it's not that we're cutting down, you know, clear cutting or anything of the sort. We're actually, the oils we produce are actually a byproduct of these reforestation efforts we do. And so it's a really powerful thing to be part of. And I know everyone in the farm team feels like, you know, they're part of something that's going to last beyond our lifetimes into the next generation. And so this is another example of that. Um, next slide, please. So this is just a, a, a conversation about um, carbon offsets and about avoiding, we're trying to do calculations on all the carbon that's not burnt and goes up in the atmosphere from the slash piles. And um, that's, 
there's a bigger conversation about this. And, you know, maybe when you're out there talking to people, there's people that want to have this net carbon or carbon neutral conversation. So we'll get more into that in one of the next slides, but um, okay, conservation. Next slide, please. So something on these farms, um, I'm, I'm sorry when I think our slides might, the sequence might've got it shuffled a little bit. So if you just, Bear with me, but if the sequence seems a little off, just, yeah, I'll try to do my best. So there's, you know, you always hear about people talking about symbiotic relationships, but do you ever hear about mutualistic relationships? And that's where I'm trying to um, put more of our focus because in this, this space of regenerative agriculture, the, the microbiome, the soil alone, there's, a relationship going on between the plants and the microbiome that there's a there's a level of communication taking place that um you know people are just starting to gain a knowledge of and how vast it is but what ends up happening is it's not just a symbiotic relationship that goes two ways it's a, a mutualistic relationship that's going several different ways but for the benefit of all and so it's not you know it's not that there's a parasite in this relationship you know, the, these different funguses, they tap into the roots of our different crops and they, they feed off a of carbon sugar the plant is purposely giving to that fungus. And this fungus, whether there's a mycorrhizal fungal or there's a hypea, there's several of them. But instead of a plant only being able to expand the, the distance of its root to take nutrient, it actually can go way, way beyond that to a point that um, is hard to believe because these fungal networks, if you don't disc or till, don't get destroyed. And so the plant is actually able to communicate to these different funguses or bacteria what nutrient it's needing. And it's able to deliver it from far, far away from its root zone. So that's anyhow, there's several examples of it. Um, so something that's really special that started to happen all of our farms. And if you've watched Jacob Young's podcast on this, we started to build native pollinator habitats on all of our farms. And so again, you know, Gary, he would say in seed to sill, we don't create separation. You could look at that as that we don't place one thing and more importance on one thing or the other, as far as the quality and the commitment, but it's also an approach of not separating living systems on our farms. And so, so in, in Utah, in France, in Idaho, we, and we've started to build, we found seed banks of what, not all native bees. And so that you could bring in hives and they could do a pollination for you. And they do that in um, big agriculture a lot, but we're actually trying to build habitats for the native bees. And oftentimes, I mean, they don't, they don't have huge hives. They even nest in the mud or different fallen trees. Hey, Brett, you got frozen for a minute. This, Are you this there? slide that's up right now is an example of uh, Brett was, how Brett was talking about how they, some of these native bees actually dig into the trees and the, into the mud, just so you know. Yeah, perfect, Michael. So, yeah, and that's, again, you know, some, some farms will bring on all these commercial beehives, and that's completely different than what we're trying to accomplish. We're trying to accomplish habitat for these native bees that um you know some of their species are at a critical level and so it's it's really special though because you can actually see the results very very quickly when you bring harmony back to nature i mean and get out of its way it's just amazing how quick it bounces back but it, I, I like to say that on our farms we provide ample example of all this and so the next time you're in idaho mona france and if, if this is of interest to you, please ask for it because it's all there. I mean, it's all very easy to observe. Um, next slide, please. So 
So this is special and I hope, you know, everyone's able to record this or take a screenshot of this. Um, so this is Dr. Wilson from Utah State University. And he actually visited the farm in Provence with Nick, um, Nicholas and Joseph Young. And you see on the slide, I mean, this is his third party analysis. And look at the level of native pollinators on the Young Living Farm compared to the neighboring farms. And again, it's just, it's something really powerful to actually, you know, produce the crops we need to, the oils we need to, but also it works in harmony with nature. And I think that's something that is becoming more and more apparent, you know, to, especially to, to young living people, but hopefully even the general population. And I, I know we've, we've done this presentation for groups in Sweden and um, different groups around the US. And they said, wow, I have friends that aren't really even interested in Young Living, but they would support Young Living if they even knew this much was going on. So we'll, we'll jump into more of these conservation projects. If in the next slides, if we do the next slide, please. So the Monarch Way Stations. And so um, I always wanna give credit where credit's due. And I mean, we, Young Living has an amazing farm team, but we also have amazing people throughout the company. and. Um, Tyler Wilson, who's been in R&D for years and years and years. He even did, ran the, the GC during some of the winter harvest with Gary. He started this Monarch Way Station um, project. And so, you know, we have the Monarch butterflies that are migrating every year from Canada to different regions in Mexico. And they, they feed off the milkweed and actually put their, their chrysalises in milkweed that they, they build their cocoons at. Um, and so we started a project. Yeah, there we go. So there's a chrysalis. And these, um, these caterpillars you see were actually at the Mona farm during Silver Retreat in the fall festival. And some of the milkweed plants had up to 20 of these caterpillars in it. And so we have, it, it's amazing. This is a really special project. And we have, a, we have the milkweed, I mean, sorry, the way station at the, the GHQ2, the corporate offices in Utah. We have it at both Idaho Farms and Mona. But we have a really exciting project this year that we're gonna start a lot of these milkweed seeds in the greenhouses of Mona, give them to Young Living employees, um, give them to the general public too that's interested, and also to our Young Living brand partners. So this is something we can all be part of. and. Um, when I've, I've been at Mona a lot in September and October, every day I was there, I could see the monarchs flying around the farm, almost like a mascot to the farm. And, and again, it's just, it's amazing how quick nature bounces back, especially with our support. I mean, I don't, I don't want to get too philosophical here, but I feel like it's been framed that, you know, human existence is only a negative. We can only minimize our impact. It's, and I don't see that to be the case at all. I mean, in, in natural law, there's such abundance and that's, um, you know, when you give back, you can give back to nature, but we can also produce these crops and make these amazing essential oils that touch all our lives. So something that you really have to experience though and see for yourself. Well, this is one of our best waste stations. It's in Elmira, Idaho. For those of you that don't know Elmira, Idaho, it's eight miles from the Highland Flats Distillery. And what we've done is we've had our lab managers, where they do the analytics and run all the lab instruments. They do have some extra time in a, a regard. And so our, our lab manager, Sabrina Ruggles, with, with the farm team built this way station. And it's such an impressive way station. It's, it's registered with the Monarch Society. We're starting to have people that don't even know Young Living visit these way stations that are just Monarch butterfly enthusiasts. So it's, it's, it's powerful. And that's you know, what we're gonna do in Utah, giving it out to the general public, our employees, so they feel more part of the special things that Young Living does and our brand partners. So hopefully this more and more becomes a, a movement that you know everyone can be part of so again i apologize everyone i'm working off my phone so it's a little hard for me to see but i want to start 
providing maps and you know a key or a legend to each farm to show the different projects we're doing. And so this is the Mona farm. On the Mona farm, there's three different monarch way stations. There's a native pollinator seed zone for all the native pollinators. There's a wetland we're building. And then there's also a, a raptor habitat. If you've ever been down there, there's all these raptors that live in the giant cottonwood trees. And so we've started to expand that, planting more riparian vegetation. If you're not familiar with the term riparian, it basically just means next to a stream bank or a, a, you know, a lake, a waterway. And so all these farms are becoming productive for our agricultural purposes, but also just teeming with life in, you know, from the, the level of the microbiology of the soil to beneficial insects like ladybugs, praying mantises, and then going all the way out to larger life. And so anyhow, my hope though, is to have a, uh, a worldwide map of all of our projects. Something I love about Young Living is, you know, so many companies are claiming things like this right now. And it's, it's just all a, a public relations effort. You know, Young Living, I mean, for those of you that, you know, knew Gary or know, know of him, you know how much he loves nature, how much he loves wildlife. I mean, this has always been our values. And so to take it into the, to the next level is just something really, really special to be part of. And I've noticed, I mean, these are our employees working on the, the way station Elmira. I mean, it has brought a meaning to their work and they feel like they're part of something they're just so proud of. I mean, even Sabrina is in this photo, depending on how you look at it, whether it's left or right on your side, she's the shortest person. And she said she was, um, she, she can't even believe it. She was manifesting a job where she could do laboratory analytics, but also do conservation work. I mean, where else would you find that besides Young Living? And so it's just, yeah, it's brought a whole new sense of meaning and purpose to our employees. Uh, next slide, please. Let me move on from this one, Brett. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, this is just another, another level of life that we, we touched on a little bit and we'll have a slide coming up about what, what's called vermiculture or the worm casting and all the teas derived from worms in our soils. So, yeah. So the Finca Botanica, for those of you that have been there, um, we have an amazing ag agronomist named Orlando Pochenko and him and his team has built our most advanced worm casting system. Um, if you're not familiar with worm castings, it's, it's pretty simple. Yeah. Um, it's just the excrement worms make as they go through soils. And it's actually one of the most beautiful fertilizers. It, it's, it has a high concentration of nitrogen, but you cannot over fertilize it. And I mean, nitrogen is dangerous because too much of it can really burn plants and damage them. We got worms, Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, Pamela. So, um, but all of our farms have these worm casting units and it's a way that we're able to apply this really beautiful safe fertilizer. But another part of it is that there's an actually a tea, a drain system, a perforated drain system where we're able to pull a tea and you actually pull the microbiome from the worms GI tract. And so you're able to help build the biome too in the soils with a perfect balanced worm, you know, microbiome intestine, <laughs> intestinal biome. So it's, it's, yeah, it's incredible. Um, next slide, everybody, please, Michael. Oh, real quick, Brett. Yeah. Everybody, um, everybody should know that Mary loves this part. That's one of her favorites. <laughs> the, the worm? Well, we call it, yeah, <laughs> in Ecuador, so nice, we call it the worm palace because these worms have like the nicest house of uh, any, probably any worm on earth, but that's not these boxes here, but this facility that, yeah, the worm palace, it's, yeah. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, California red wigglers, yeah. So, 
So the orchard greenhouse. Um, oh, we jumped one, Michael. I know I'm going too fast. I'm sorry. Give me one second. There we go. <clears throat> so we have we have an orchid greenhouse and then a, a conservation project in Ecuador. There are a lot of endangered orchids, and so we've we've grown them in our greenhouses, and it's actually in the highlands. And we we have a, a large acreage where we're repopulating endangered orchids. We've actually identified an endangered orchid in Utah, and so we want to start the orchid project there. But there's you know, some of this life is so delicate. It's just really, it's a really special feeling to step in and provide protection and, you know, get it, get these really fragile um, species like an orchid reestablished. Next slide, please. So this is a special project, um, just really unique too, and it would fit Gary. I mean, I just can't imagine how excited he'd be about this. I mean, for those of you that saw Gary when he really got excited, it was so fun to be around. I mean, it was just contagious, really. And so, you know, the state of Utah with the state of Nevada is partnered, and the, the bighorn sheep population in Utah is almost completely extinct because of these different viruses they find in them because they get their they get to their proximity to get too close to domestic sheep that carry a lot of these viruses and so they found a herd of untouched bighorn sheep in the deserts of nevada and they were able to trap these sheep and bring them to the sky rider ranch in tabiona and set up a breeding project so they will breed the bighorn sheep of the tabiona farm sky rider and then reintroduce them all over to the wild of utah nevada and so i mean in the future, the genetics of the bighorn sheep around Utah, Nevada, will all pass through the Skyrider Ranch, which I mean, that I mean, for Gary, that would just be such an exciting project. So if you visit Skyrider, I'll make sure to ask the managers if you can't view the breeding area for the bighorn sheep. And it's, it's amazing too, it's all high fence. It's not a little pin, it's a vast wilderness that these sheep are in with red rocks. And I mean, I've seen them there and I mean, they're living a good life and they're, they're serving a really high purpose for a safe place. We'll have to make sure you see it next time. I'll talk to the manager, Skyler, about making sure people can visit the Bighorn Sheep Breeding Project. Uh, next slide, please. So this is something really special too in Tabiona and the valley is so beautiful. And we're just starting to get the crops to where Gary wanted them and the, the potential we always saw there. But the D. Gary Young Wildlife Sanctuary is the largest donation to the state of Ida, uh, state of Utah, sorry, 6,000 acres that for perpetuity will be untouched. And it's another thing you can experience when you go out there. Um, well, um, I'll try to get better events going in Tabiona. So you don't, you know, when you actually visit, there's a, an itinerary or way to visit all, because it's, it's a vast farm. I think it's close to 18,000 acres. So, um, but this is just another thing. I mean, no one made Gary do this and he didn't do it to win awards with some PR firm. He did it because this was in heart and soul, how much he valued nature and wildlife. And so it's just, yeah, really, really special, special project he did. Uh, next slide, please. So turtle refuges, um, 
So I started to observe in Elmira and Highland Flats, we have these painted turtles. And um, when I'm being really good, I, I jog three times a week. And I was jogging around the farm and I saw these turtles marching up this huge sandy hill. I mean, but even this hill, when, I, when I'm out of shape, I have a hard time getting to the top of it. I'm like, what are they doing? And um, anyhow, I saw them start to nest. And so once we were aware of that, we became incredibly mindful of it. And we blocked the whole habitat off with boulders. And so, I mean, none of our um, vehicles or tractors would drive over the nest. And also sometimes we have neighbors that will trespass on our properties with their ATVs or motorcycles. And so we literally blocked it off to make it impossible to get even a motorcycle through there. And so we could protect the space for these nesting painted turtles in North Idaho. Next slide, please. So this is a side-by-side -side comparison of what our Highland Flats spru blue spruce fields look like when they're cover cropped and before. And so <clears throat> we've been transitioning all the farms to no disc, no till or minimal surface tillage. But every time you disc or till a field, you, you break the house that the, the microbiome is living in. You expose it to sunlight, it all gets you know damaged, baked in the sun and the, the carbon also bakes off in the sun it, it'll evaporate and so you know the cover cropping is it's really important because it's it's counterintuitive when you're not used to it and you see when you look in nature and you think that everything's competing but what you find is there's actually a lot more cooperation than competition and so especially when you do a cover crop blend you'll never do a single species you'll usually do seven to 12 different species and each species has a very specific purpose. I mean, some of them, the legumes are the most um, consistent producer of uh, nitrogen. And so they'll actually, I mean, our, our atmosphere, the majority is, not, is nitrogen. Funny thing is it's also the main fertilizer you'll use for vegetative growth and most expensive fertilizer. And so to literally pull the nitrogen out of the air and deposit it in the soil. We have some really great clovers we use for this purpose too. Um, we will have a lot of different like an alfalfa or these different um, radishes that will actually go deep into the soil and break up the compaction of clays. What it also does though is aerate the soil and it drives the microbiome deep into the soil. And so the more, um, it's really similar to if you, you think about if you've ever had your um, biome analyzed in your gut, if your biome has been killed off or it's out of balance, it's really hard for your body to make nutrient available. I mean, the soil is no different. And I, you can get to a point with regenerative agriculture where you're really not using fertilizers anymore. You're feeding the life and the, the biome in the soil to make nutrient available and more than what they call MPK, right? The nitrogen, phosphate, and potassium, you're really making these micronutrients and trace nutrients available. So we have the, the healthiest plants in the world. And that of course translates into the, I mean, the most incredible essential oils. So it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's a long topic though. So we won't dive too deep into it, but um, go to the next slide, please. So yeah, this without soil, there's only dirt. And that basically means without biology or life in the soil, it's, it's just dust, right? And so again, we, um, you know, we always treat the soils as a living system. Fun little fact that not everyone knows is, uh, you know, 95% of all life on earth, on land is in the top six inches of topsoil. They say an average healthy, tablespoon of topsoil can have 7 billion microbes in it. And I know that might sound hard to believe. So something that's fun we've been doing on our farms is bringing the soil 
into our laboratories and actually looking at the microbes underneath a microscope. And so if you've never seen a, a nematode chase down and eat nutrients or protozoas bounce all around or these different fungal networks, it's, it's a really powerful experience. And it, you change your whole focus into getting these populations balanced. Um, something we've done at Highland Flats that's really neat is we'll go out to undisturbed forest and we'll dig down at a grand fir root zone and we'll cut a chunk of that root and then we'll put it in what's called a, a bioreactor. And it's where there's, there's nutrients and, you know, for these, the, and the right oxygen levels for the, this microbiome just to bloom. I mean, given, given the right temperatures, oxygen levels, nutrients, the microbiomes will just explode. And then we're able to put that back onto our soils. So even in Japan with Dr. Wu, I was able to ask Dr. Wu to go out to undisturbed shell ginger and cut at its root zones and then put it in, a, in this, these um, bioreactors and build this perfect microbiome that's been, you know, evolving and developing since the beginning of time. Um, and again, so there's another, another big part of this is actually putting organic matter into our soils. And you could look at organic matter as these roots that are gonna go in and decompose. And, um, but <clears throat> it actually retains an incredible amount of water. It builds a system of what they call an aggregate, different than you're probably used to hearing that word in a, in a sentence. But it's basically just a network of teeny little tunnels and root zones that actually, at the same time they aerate the soil, they hold water. And so even an organic farm that disks and tills, they'll use, lose 40% of their fertilizer to run off or erosion. And that will end up, end up in the watersheds which is actually really damaging because it causes all kinds of algae blooms, floral blooms. And so with no disc, no till, I mean, your water, your irrigation water doesn't run off, your rainwater doesn't run off. It's called infiltration, the, the rate you can hold inches of water per hour. And you're holding water, retaining water and oxygen at the same time. Uh, next slide, please. So this is really interesting and um, especially, you know, as in Europe all summer and I don't know if anybody saw what was going on in Holland with restrictions on nitrogen with the farmers and all the, the you know, the uprisings against it. You know, and I, I have one of my best friends actually teaches at a university in Holland and I'm like, well, why don't they let these farmers just offset their nitrogen use with these nitrogen fixers or these carbon fixing cover crops. Something that's really neat about this is it's, it's not um, opaque or nebulous. You can actually very, very, very um, clearly measure the amount of nitrogen and carbon that these different legumes, clovers are putting in the soil. And then all the plants actually sequester carbon, but a different carbon sugar, they'll, it's just amazing what these plants are capable of. They'll also create a different carbon sugar that in turn feeds a different part of the microbiome. So again, though, if you if you have people though that are really into the whole carbon neutral, carbon net positive, if you looked at Young Living Farms with the amount of reforestation we're doing and the cover crops are doing, I mean, we have a carbon bank that would just be, I, I can't even imagine. We're trying to actually pinpoint where we stand there, but for some people that's, um, you know, something they're very interested in. Yeah, I mean, our carbon bank would, I mean, offset the rest of the business tenfold and we could probably be selling carbon credits around the world but um you know again i mean that's that's great but we do it though because the carbon is one of the most necessary things for the soil the nitrogen feeding the microbiome and it is just how the natural living soil the biome in the soil works is a, a carbon cycling uh, next slide please So yeah, I think we've seen a slide basically like this. Um, 
you know, it's amazing to when you have nowhere in nature that has, you know, healthy soils, would you ever see bare soil exposed? That's not what mother nature does. Yeah, that those are your grandfather, absolutely, Pamela. And so it'll even keep the, the temperatures of the soil in the summer 15 degrees different, having this cover. And again, that really protects the soil, protects the moisture levels. Um, next slide, please, Michael. So these are different fields. Um, you can see the blue, the blue spruce, and then you can see a ground fir plot. Um, something we've done really, we've done with our trees that are really exciting that we didn't used to do is called stump culturing. And so when we harvest these trees, we actually, you know, they don't perish. We just cut the top one third to two thirds off. And then the leader, like you'd normally see when you see a Christmas tree grower, just a, a, a tree in the wild splits into two. And so it's, it's pretty amazing because we used to, you know, clear the fields on our tree farms and then replant it. And then you have the small bare root seedling that has a small little root zone that's happened to build off of. Now we have these huge root zones and um, we're just, yeah, it's, um, it's really amazing because now we're not having, to, we still plant, we have greenhouses and we continually replant every year. But yeah, the stump culturing, the tree just gets a little haircut and instead of having to regrow a whole tree it has this giant established root zone underneath it and bounces back incredibly fast. And so it's all just ways we're finding to, you know, we grow crops for such a specific reason that there's all kinds of amazing new methods we find that really suit our purposes for essential oils. Uh, next slide, please. So yeah, this is kind of a fun slide, you know. Does the soil keep the plant from blowing away or do the plants keep the roots from blowing away? And um, if you've ever read about the dust bowl in the Midwest, you know, there's record of the dust that was getting blown, hitting ships all the way in the Atlantic Ocean and getting covered by dust. And so that's another, you know, a way to think about it that, you know, the plants are actually holding our soils. And you see this gentleman right here and the amount of penetration that this um, vetiver plant has made. And that's we'll target specific species just to break into compaction like this. Even something everyone knows alfalfa and it actually has a root zone that goes down below six feet. And um, even if Highland Flats, so the top soil is actually not very deep at all, same as St. Mary's. And so to actually go down and hit that clay and start breaking it up and turning it into topsoil, you can build topsoil at rates that people once upon a time thought was not possible. And so again, hopefully when you come to our farms, you don't, you don't run into a dust storm. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, when I, when I look at a, a farm, you know, I'm, I mean, what's under the surface is incredibly important, but I actually think more about what's under the surface. And I mean, this is a, a cutaway, but it doesn't give you any idea of the scope of the, the biology actually in soil. But you can see all these different, um, you know, these, I'm gonna go ahead and call them sentient beings. There's these, these life in the soil that are all having an interaction. And um, when we honor that life, the amount of health in our soil, the fertility, the nutrient available for our crops has increased a hundredfold. Um, you know, it's um, really sad how soil has been treated the last 60, 70 years with big agriculture. But the, the exciting part of the conservation projects and the soils is treated right, they rebound quicker than anybody even imagined possible. Um, next slide, please. Yeah. 
So yeah, we, we've touched on all of these. Um, you know, diverse cover cropping, the ground is covered. You know, we use biology instead of chemistry for our, to make nutrient available. Um, one thing we haven't touched on though is um, what's called often called mob grazing. So maybe at Mona, you've seen the, the sheep or in France, so that the sheep are helping control weeds to a certain degree, but more than anything, they're actually having the soil get activated through the natural cycles, just like when the buffalo roam. And I mean, the, the hoofs aerate, the, the animals will fertilize, and it just, it just mimics that natural cycle. These animals going through these lands were always part of the natural cycle, and it actually really charges the microbiome and activates them is and that might seem surprising but it, once those um you know an undula or animal with hoofs is in the, in these soils it actually really activates the microbiome as well so now next slide please so Again, this is another example of putting organic matter back in our fields, but like at Highland Flats, we, we have these um, amendment spreaders where we take the wood chips and put them back into our fields. So it just breaks back down and it, it makes to me what's a closed loop system, you know, and that's, we have that, we try to do that anywhere we can, where, you know, it's not a broken chain, but just a cycle that just has a closed loop or kind of a, a circular life to it. Um, next slide, please. Oh, love that photo. <laughs> Wait, there you go, Pamela. Okay, I'm glad to hear someone else talk. It gets it gets weird staring at your phone. And just... <laughs> Sorry, you're doing awesome. You know, we've... We're, we're, no, we've... we're at that we're all... hour, but you go ahead and close what you want to say. But yeah, this is my experience of reforestation, which was fantastic. Well, I, I think it's the perfect place to end then, Pamela. Yeah. But I mean, I mean that's, a, that's a memory, though, that you'll never forget, right? And that's what we're trying to put people in that situation, because then that you leave it and you get into your day-to-day -day life. But I mean, seeing this photo, I mean, what does that do to you? I mean, it... Yeah, I think the, the cool part about that photo is, yes, we spent, there were 26 of us that spent two we a week, to, some stayed a week, some stayed two weeks, and we planted over 6,000 balsam fir trees, grand fir trees now. But the cool thing was it was Gary's idea to say, oh, you got to have a stick in the ground that has your name on it that says, this is my row. And that was like the cool touches that he did for us yeah. and the adventure that he gave us in that education. And some of the gals on here are like, ah, oh, I want to get more into my garden. I love that. And for someone like me that my husband and my family's life has been more in a city environment, even though I grew up on a farm with my grandparents and things, I haven't had the opportunity other than through Young Living to be on farmland. And I think that is such a beautiful thing that our company gives. And I just want to invite everyone still on this call to visit a farm. Visit one of Young Living's farms. For sure. Well, it's, it's, it's the farm team's favorite part is sharing this with all of you. It really is. So, Yay. Well, Brett, this got so much attention that can I say, can, can we make a pact for you when you're in like a stable environment where you can really feel, your slides were great and the presentation was awesome, but can I, can I challenge you to do a really um, uh, presentation on all this and more so that we can just pop it all over our social media? And yeah. not be so, like, yes, we want to be Gary-centric. We want to talk about Gary Young, but we got to use full names. Like, for us to share it out to people that aren't already in Young Living, yeah. we need to have a little bit more um, behind it so that people understand. Can we get that sometime in the near future? Yeah, I would love to hear some feedback. And sorry, the slides got a little out of sequence. Oh. But, I mean, we're, we're always wanting to tweak and... 
you know, that is, that's a really good point. A lot of times it's kind of built for people already in young living. It'd be yeah. really nice to have it level, you know? So yeah. yeah, I'd love to have it where I can just blast it out to people that have no idea. The young living people will get it too, but those newbies, yeah. like you said, that don't know we have all these things that they can participate in, that would be fantastic. Well, yeah, please, when you get a chance, give us, some, me and Michael, some feedback, because, I mean, we, we, um, we're we always trying to improve. We, we don't live the side of the business you do. Yeah, but and, you, you live the most important side of the business, as we're all, like, saying, yay! <laughs> yeah, I'm going to give you, you know, material and content that you can relay really easily, and to a, a perfect stranger, it's effective, you know? That would be fabulous. So, yeah. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Anything you want to add, Stacy, Danette? No, it's just beautiful and awesome. And uh, obviously keeping with what you have just expressed here is like, you know, the, the heart of the workers um, and the people who are, are doing this. And you guys are at the farm because you love the farm and you love that whole environment. So, which a lot of us do too. When you just said you had the best part, I was like, ah, I'd rather be on the farm <laughs> personally. <laughs> But um, it's just it's just exciting. So your heart and passion, that presentation is oh. like perfect. But yeah, it's just it's be so great. More. No, I mean, I mean the best. Actually, all visit us on the farm. I'm gonna share. You know, share that setting. Share the seed to sill. I mean, that is the I'm, everyone that works on the farm. I mean, that's their favorite part is having you on the farm. It really is. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not just something we say. I mean, it is. It is by far the best part. So yeah, please. The farms are always open. Um, the tour booking sites running again. It was shut down for a minute. So I mean, I mean, the, just know that the farms are always open, and I mean, you're always welcome. And it's, I mean, we can't wait. We love your presentation, Brett. Love it. Thank you, and thank you, Michael. Well, give, you're welcome. Give us some good, making it better for you. So it's all good. It's so good. Okay, well, I miss everyone. Hopefully see you thank soon. Thank you, Brett. Okay, yep. thank you, everybody. Have a great so night. So great. Thank you, Michael. Yep, you're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.